All right, so this is a deck that we, um, this is a deck that we had played right after Rune Terra's most recent set had dropped. It's leveraging almost all target cards, so it's mainly leaning on the Nightfall mechanic, which your your two mechanics, Nightfall and Invoke. One of them is Nightfall, so Nightfall cards gain a bonus if they're not explicitly the first card you've played in a round. So Diana is probably my favorite champion in the game right now. She's a very good, both aggressive and mid-rangey champion. She has quick attack, which means she hits first when attacking. And her nightfall trigger says if she's not the first card you play in the turn, she gains challenger, which can force something to block her. So Diana is basically board control that remains around to be a threat. So it's just everything a mid-range deck wants to be doing. And she synergizes with all of our other various Nightfall cards. If we've used Nightfall four plus times, she turns into a slightly bigger unit that then gets Challenger and more attack every time you trigger Nightfall subsequently. The other champion in this deck is another Nightfall champion, Nocturne. He's Fearsome, which is a form of evasion here. And then his Nightfall trigger says he grants the enemy vulnerable, which means you can force it to block, be force it to block something you're attacking with. And he gives enemies minus one attack. His leveled mode is very good at closing games out, gives everything you control fearsome, and makes your opponent stuff smaller when you play out units. So makes your things harder to block, and then shrinks the things that they have that can block them. So he's a very good game ender in the mid to late game. Um, the other mechanic that this deck leverages is the invoke mechanic. So this is an invoke card. This says invoke a celestial card that costs seven or more and then heal an ally or your nexus five. So celestial cards are a pool of cards that you can't collect or put into decks. There are 20 some of them that range from zero cost to 10 cost. And generally speaking, um, cards like that one I just showed give a range that they invoke from. So that one specifically invokes 7 to 10 cost things, 7 plus cost. And these are all pretty much like game finishers. Very powerful pieces of removal or giant threats that close the game out very quickly. There's other utility, um, utility invoke cards like Solari Priestess, which specifically gets a 4, 5, or 6 invoke card. That's a very good mid-range card. A lot of the, the Celestial cards in the, those casting costs are good utility tools. So uh, let's go ahead and dive on into some games with this. I am very interested to see if this deck still feels competitive uh, in, in today's games at, now that the meta has been more fleshed out. The first time... Uh, the last time we played this, the format was still really developing, and there were a lot of people testing out brews. Nocturne. I mean, we have plenty of Nightfall things that attack, Percy. We have Witch and stuff, too. Witch, Diana, the Elusive. Nocturne self-enabling. He enables himself. This isn't this isn't an aggressive Nocturne deck. We're not playing Nocturne on turns like four, five, or six with him leveled and killing them. We're a mid-range deck that's looking to be interactive. So opponent is playing Swain Twisted Fate. So they're a mid-range deck. Mid-range control. Like I'm gonna mulligan Doom Beast. I'm gonna keep my sources a card advantage and my first threat to pressure a little bit. Yeah, I'm, interest, I'm interested to see if the kind of mid-rangey plan that this deck tries to execute is going to be good enough against Peaceful. decks like Twisted Fate, Twisted Swain. I think I just got aggressive here, so this explicitly makes a Dusk Petal for our hand. You can only build from sets, right? So it's all block constructed. No, that's not true, Ostin. So this deck that we're playing happens to be mostly set three cards, but you can mix and match cards however you want in this game. Uh, from a visual perspective, this game is the most visually appealing card game that I've ever played. And the mobile version... The mobile version of this game looks identical to this. It plays just as smoothly and looks just as good with all the colors and animations. Very, very well done software. So this is a little scary. So they've made some deck hand, they've made some powder kegs here, which these things say their next spell is gonna deal two extra damage that deals damage to all my stuff. 
So they could have a Make It Rain here, which deals one damage normally to three things, but these will crank it up to three. I think I'm playing Solari Priestess anyways, just because it generates value with the Invoke. I think Golden Sister sounds great. So, um, something that's good... I'm just gonna go ahead and block like this. Attacking and blocking in this game is similar to Magic. They declare ta attackers, we declare blockers. Um, the, 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 one of the ways in which this game really differs from Magic, though, is that, um, the way the turns are structured. So you'll see every single turn, there really isn't a my turn versus their turn, because every turn, both players draw a card and get their resources back. Now, something to note here about the resource system that's really, really awesome and um, innovative is you'll note here, my opponent has two extra mana on top of their four for the turn. One of the ways in which they combat what I would refer to as curve variants in Rune Terra is that you can save up to three mana to carry over in between turns. This means, unlike in games like Hearthstone and Magic, where it's important that you're playing on curve or you're going to fall behind... Um, you can skip turns in the early turns, but not just lose those resources to not being efficient with them, which is great. These kegs are vulnerable, so I can force them to block here. And they have make it rain, so they're going to kill my stuff. Yep. And you can see here, when I mouse over this eye, it tells me how combat and the stack are going to work. So it tells me, hey, Jeff, if you just click OK here, all three of these things are going to die, and you're going to take three. Uh, you only get priority again before your attackers deal damage dirty digits if um, if your opponent blocks or does something. Yeah, mana banking. You can bank up to three mana. And the mana that you bank is explicitly called spell mana because you can't use it to play units out. You can only use it to play spells. They have Twisted Fate here, which is a really scary champion that I want to kill before he sees them draw eight cards. So I think I'm going to grab the Warrior here, which has the Challenger mechanic, which can force Twisted Fate to block him to remove him in combat. Okay, I had uh, I had heard good things about uh, Faria as a card game, but it was never one that I played. Yeah, the, the mana baking in general, I think, is just incredibly, incredibly awesome. What's the term for creatures in this game? So, there are two types of um, allies. Are refers to both followers and champions. So, champion cards, you can only have six total of in your deck. And they level up. So, they get more powerful when conditions are met. No, I think the learning curve, especially if you're familiar with other card games, is very easy to pick up in Runeterra. Their in-game tutorial is excellent. It has a bunch of optional levels that, like, give you puzzles that teach you how every mechanic in the game works. And it's really well done. So, I have my challenger here that could force this to block. I think I want to just play Diana out here, though, too. Swain's close to leveling. I'm going to play Lenari Dustbringer and see what they do. Again, similar to Magic, there's a priority-based system every turn, so I play a card, they get a chance to play a card. So this is the this is the punishment here. I played a card without starting by attacking, so they played a card that stunned this, so this can no longer attack this turn. That's not too big of a deal, though, because I have Diana to play out here, who's going to have Challenger... So she can force Twisted Fate to block her. Yours is a light I cherish, Moon Sister. I agree with that. That learning the card pool is probably more challenging than um. This is gonna level their swaying rate. Merely pawns in a greater game. Empire above all. Hey, Waffle, thanks for the tier 1 sub. I appreciate it. Play out Doom Beast here. So, 
so yeah, so the thing that kind of differentiates my turn from their turn is who gets to attack each turn. So you can see here, there's this little sword here, which means when I have priority, I can declare attackers. I don't really have great attacks. So I think I'm just passing, and then when I end the turn here, the attack token flips over to them. Yes, and there are game mechanics like Rally that kind of break that rule, right? That change, change who, who can attack. I agree with the people in chat saying that the hardest part of picking up Runeterra is learning the playable card pool rather than the core rules. The core rules are very, very straightforward and fairly intuitive, especially if you have a card game background. So I'm going to start with Stalking Shadows here and see what we find. This looks at the top four cards in my deck and gives me uh, only one choice. So if there had been multiple followers in the top of my deck, I would have been able to pick between them. And then this is a Burst Spell, which Burst Spells, unlike Slow or Fast, they don't form a stack in the middle, and you can't respond to them. So play Lenari Priestess here, which invokes. None of those are super useful, so they would just take this as a redraw, basically. Okay, so they just played a card that's going to let them draw three fleeting cards next turn. So we're probably dead. Leveled, leveled, twisted fate. And again, I probably should have opened on attacks with my warrior the previous turn and not, not, not have given them a chance to stun it. Alright, there's a meteor shower so I can kill their twisted fate, but they're all going to be leveled at this point, which is a pretty tough nut to crack. Yes, you can win them all. Now, Twisted Fate's really powerful. The first three cards they play in a round cause my opponent to play Destiny cards. So in order with every card my opponent plays, they play blue card to draw, red card to deal one to all my stuff, and gold card to deal two and stun. Twisted Fate's one of the harder champions to level up in this game, and he's very good once he gets leveled. It's pretty rare that you lose a game where Twisted Fate gets going. So it in. Twisted Fate did die. Their their deck isn't good at protecting Twisted Fate at least. So we've got we've got that going for us. My spirit shines. Cool. So this deals four to a unit that's thunder damaged, and then this lets them deal an extra there. Wait, are they just taking six inside of combat here? They must have another Twisted Fate, huh? So, this card is Fearsome, which normally means I can't block it. However, I have Hush here, which wipes all of the text off of this card till end of turn. It just basically says, hey, you no longer have a text box, you're just stats. So I can block this now so it doesn't destroy me. You cannot hold us down. You were misguided. We trade off a bunch of these here. So I'm going to take three from the spider and its baby at the end, and then all of those are going to trade. Uh. 
So this is ephemeral from the Stalking Shadows copy that got made. So this dies at the end of the round. So I don't want to play that one out just yet. I think I'm going to start on the Traveler and see what we get. Obliterate an enemy. That sounds good. Swain's got to go. So space. So this card is fleeting. Hush makes fleeting copies. So you can basically keep playing it if you have mana. But fleeting means it's going to go away at end of turn. So I'm going to get a little bit of value out of that fleeting card by playing Species Sketcher and discarding it. To go ahead and invoke a Celestial here. Would love a Trickster. Yeah, I, I agree, Stale Moves. And I kind of expect that that's going to change slash get fleshed out more once um once the next the next two two sets drop. So remember the small set that they're gonna be releasing in October and then December will still be target focused. So my opponent just passed here. I kind of want to play a card out, but looking at the mana, if I end the round, I'll bank three of my four mana losing one and they'll only bank three of their eight so i think i'm supposed to end the turn here because it burns my opponent in terms of resource efficiency rounds rounds end in rune terra when both players just pass do i want to falling comet swain I think so. How do you endo? And they just passed again, huh? Can I kill them with Nocturne? I'm gonna play Trickster first and see what they do. Because if they play something big, I want a vulnerable there's something big. They might they might play something out with Trickster. So instance, there are fast spells and burst spells in this game. But the kind of whole concept of instance is different because both players are playing every turn. Yeah, I, I kind of feel like I want to end the round again here, right? Because again, I'm going to save three of my four mana and they're going to lose all ten. I'm giving up an attack to do so, but their board is so bad. So the problem here is if I attack with the elusive, they then get a chance to make plays. So because they pass back to me without doing anything, I think I punish them and just end the round. The attack for three I don't think is super relevant. Cause like I'm gonna get to deploy Golden Sister and a Fearsome Thing and then have good attacks on my next turn that are likely lethal. The, the priority system back and forth in this game gives you a ton of room to outplay and make decisions like that and punish people for doing things like my opponent is doing here and just like they're trying to bait me into making a play but i'm just not biting and i'm burning their mana each turn because of it Open your eyes. i love this the artwork on these celestials they're so good every card has a full art basically that you can click into in the game the ip is so good We're trying to dome me here. So this card has an extra trigger if it's not the first card I played each turn. So I'm going to play Stalking Shadows out here as a burst card. Grab this Lenari Priestess. And then I'm going to go ahead and... Uh, talking about instant, my opponent's playing a card that deals three to this to deal three to me. But if I kill this in response, they won't get to deal three. And you can see when I put my card on the stack before I click OK... 
it'll it can show me what's going to happen and even shows a face down card in my hand being generated from this making a random nightfall card so the rope in this game is more aggressive than magic arena but because there's the eye over here to tell you how combat's gonna work i don't really think it's a big deal I think the, the way in which they approach the timer in this game is super refreshing. It feels like you get an adequate amount of time to make decisions. Okay, so they're at 8 mana. Do I just like play Golden Sister out here? So Golden Sister's a 4-3 lifesteal for 6. That makes a 4-3 elusive as well. This could be a Rex turn. That's true. Do I just like pass and see if Rex happens? Yeah, because if they just end the turn, I have a decent open attacks. Sick. Good read on the Rex. So Rex is an awesome cannon shark. When he comes into play, if they hit me, which they did, he, he casts seven cannon barrages at random, which deal two damage to a unit. So let's see what's going to die here. Lots of stuff is going to die. What odd way for Lord. Thanks for that. The 18 months. Welcome back. All right. So what do I want to do? What do I want to do for the do for my play for the turn? I think I think it's just sister still, right? The light of my star warms the heavens. And then do we just open on attacks? I think we just sisters open on attacks, right? So opening on attacks basically means attacking before I do anything else for my turn. And the appeal to opening on attacks is my current board is better than my opponent's current board. So if I start the turn by attacking, my opponent does not get the opportunity to play units out before my attack to develop their board. They can, however, play fast spells like these to interact with my attackers so there's this give and take where if you expect your opponent has better blockers they want to deploy you want to start by attacking but if you put them on having spells you want to develop your board more first and again that's just the just the incredible amount of sequencing decisions that you get presented with in rune terra on average Oh, I probably should have played Solari Priestess, right? Because Daybreak needs to be my first card. Yeah, that was a, that was a mistake. I'm still late fall. Have I gone over survey results on stream? Uh, I have shared them briefly. I, I tweeted I tweeted them out and posted them in the subs Discord too, though. So this does four to one thing and one to another. This little Dorko here, this adorable Dorko, is tough. So he takes one less damage. So trying to deal one to him wouldn't be very useful. The the TLDR for my survey results is that I think the current mix of Rune Terra and Magic that I'm doing makes a lot of sense. I think it's a, a relatively happy mix. Gosh, should I just grab Meteor Shower again here and like deal four, deal one? Nah, they're probably gonna attack. I'm gonna grab the warrior. Warms the heart and lights the way. So this deals four to my stunned thing, sure. Falling star. Yeah, I liked I liked this build a lot last time we played it. But like a really sweet mid-range build. Okay, so I'm gonna play Dusk Petal. Then I'm gonna go ahead and play Nocturne here, which gives this vulnerable. He levels up. Uh 
Uh, when you are playing competitive decks in Runeterra, there are way more games where both players make meaningful choices than there are non-games. Non-games non are more the exception than the rule. So again, Nocturne is a powerful finisher, gives my stuff fearsome, which means they can only be blocked by things with three or more power. And when I play a unit, he shrinks all their stuff. So this is, this is really what I was talking about with Nocturne in this deck earlier. Like, Nocturne is a finisher in the late game here. He's not something we just jam early and kill them with. Yeah, yeah, Nocturne. Nocturne's evasion there gives us lethal. And this deck that we're playing is a bit of a brew that we played once before, and the opponent's deck's considered one of the best decks in the format. Rune, Rune Terra has probably the best balance team of any card game I've ever played. They're very, not only data-driven, but also take into consideration how games feel as well to a degree, which is great. Yeah, yeah, I agree, Indu Innuendo. I think a lot of that game was the fact that I passed and got really far up on tempo. Opponent is playing Misfortune Quinn, and this here, seeing your opponent's regions and champions before the game starts, adds player agency to Rune Terra because I can look at these, and as someone who knows the card pool in the metagame, I can go, they're playing an aggro deck, my hand's actually pretty good against aggro, I'm going to keep all of it. But if I had cards that explicitly weren't good against aggro, I could know that and make the choice to mulligan them. So even, even though the games are best of one, there's a lot of that you get choices inside of them. Yeah, our hand is excellent. I just take two here. Actually, you know what I could do? I could block this with the 2 1, and then I can Nightfall out Diana next turn and kill this with Challenger, right? I think I like that. So damage is persistent across turns in this game, which makes chump blocks like this a lot less bad. You're basically turning your, your chump into a part removal spell. I'm going to bank my two mana here. So I'll have three mana for units and two mana that has to be used for spells. Yeah, but I don't know that I want to burn the Pale Cascade this early. So I think I'm going to go ahead and Stalking Shadows here. There are a ton of units on top of my deck, apparently. Um, I think I'm in for Spacey Sketcher. And then Stalking Shadows draws me the card that I pick and creates me an ephemeral copy. It's kind of like a temporary copy. Put me your opinion on magic having consistent damage. Uh, I mean, it kind of does in a way, right? Like, that's already a pseudo mechanic in the game. We'll see. They could have a barrier here to save this, but if they do, I think I'm fine with that. If they like her boss. And my thing has quick attack in addition to Challenger. She just gets to eat their thing in combat, which is lovely. Serpent sounds great. Flavor and spice. Flavor and spice. Feel the sizzle. So their thing has Challenger here. They can force my thing to block. And I think I'm okay with that exchange overall. Now what I could do here to be kind of defensive that I like, I can block this. And then I can Stalking Shadows to enable Lightfall. Take the Moon Dreamer. And then I can Pale Cascade to make this a 3-2, so these all trade. I'm going to fall a little bit behind on board, but not too bad. These trades are good for me overall. Are we pretty active in this game in this card? Yes, very. Wow, that's a blowout. So they had a combat trick there that makes all their things take one less damage till end of turn. So now they savage my board, which makes my play real bad. It's not great. I'm actually here. 
I gonna die now? I might die now. Moon Dreamer. This invokes from any range. If I take the Moon Burst Silver, reduce the cost of a card in hand by one. Just good, uh. No pray, no pay. It's not a rope, it's a snake. The cards talk to each other. So I'm going to force their challenger to block mine. I suppose I could hook their misfortune instead. And then unspeakable horror kills her next turn. Maybe that's better. Yeah, I'm going to do that. She's real scary if she gets going. Yikes. Like that. So... There's a card that lets them rally, so they just get to attack now on my turn, which is very terrifying. Guns Punished for not taking their challenger here. Yep. And then the War Chef supporting Misfortune here heals her as well. So I can't, uh, I can't, uh, unspeakable horror here anymore. That was a very good rally up. I gotta show you the sights of build water. The sights are fine. The smells, on the other hand. I think we're dead here. Yeah, and this is, like, this game largely goes back to that turn I gave them the Rangers Resolve blowout, right? Like, if I, if I don't, yeah, like, I, I messed up my early turn and they just, they just, like, took the rope that I gave them and hung me with it. That's a bad reference and I'm sorry I just said that. I'm going to try and remove that from my vocabulary. That, that whole vernacular in general, give them rope, is probably, it's not even probably, it's not good, right? Let's try and, let's try and not use that. So Johnny Twisted Feet, uh, probably mid-rangey could be aggressive. This is obviously great. Diana is great. Nah, innuendo. I think the Rangers Resolve turn was more important. I think I could have played around that and I just didn't. I'm going to keep all these and see how it goes. Maybe a more mid-rangey deck, or if they are controlling, they have a slower draw. Go ahead and Stalking Shadows here to enable Nightfall. Solari Priestess is a great one to get an ephemeral copy of, because I love to invoke. I'm going to go ahead and lean on a Lenari Shade Stalker here with Elusive so we can start pressuring them. Uh, we gave them an inch and they took a mile is probably an appropriate similar vernacular slash intention. Double three three here is real scary. Um... 
I think I'm block. I think I need to go on the defensive at this point. Uh, blocking here marks two damage on this, so I can Diana to Challenger and kill it next turn, which is nice. I think I just want to Dusk Petal into Doom Beast here. This is really scary because they're a Make It Rain deck. So, like, if they have another Make It Rain, it's going to deal two to everything, which makes my Diana not particularly appealing to play next turn. We lead on Solari Priestess here and see where we go. Daylight warms the heart and lights the way. Never lost a fair game or played one. Who says I don't share? By the moon's crescent blade. Night descends. Face your heretic. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny because it's sad, Rhino. All right, I expect my opponent to open attacks here since their board's much better than mine. Definitely just going to trade Diana for their 3-2 if that's the case. Wow, we didn't open attacks. That's interesting. Okay, I just play a 3-5 then? I think I just play a 3-5, right? Let's see what we invoke. Sick. Constellations are stories in the sky. Moonlight ebbs so the stars may be heard. Turn, chase! Down to ten. Boys. Meteor shower gets to kill both of these, which is great. Bank a third spell mana. So we have ten total mana here, three of which has to be used for spells, which is fine because I want to rain down on these dorks. Better take cover. So this is an 05 that deals two damage to itself. So over the course of a few turns, it summons a bunch of powder monkeys. Deal me in. That's unfortunate. Call. Would the pale cascade have leveled Diana and Shoot. saved her? Yes. So I don't know if that was worthwhile to do though or not. I mean. To be fair to Twitch, the system was not acting in the way they had originally intended it to act. Like, was it better for viewers and streamers? Yes, but that was not their original intention. You could definitely make the argument that the original intention was poorly done. And that the glitch was a good thing, but... Yeah. It's a big shark chat. Uh, they said that people that did it before they fixed it 30 digits would not be charged differently. Shark Shark Cannon is kind of the king of the mid-range in this game. It's very good. Oh yeah, that's a pretty sparkle fly. Yeah, you were prob probably dormant long enough that it lets you waffle. Would be would be my assumption.
All right, and now we just can't win at this point, right? So, so Johnny says, um, the first time you damage the enemy nexus in a round, you frostbite all of their stuff. And they have this warning shot rolled up here that we know about from their card earlier. So they can just play this to wipe the attack off all my units. It's a very powerful level champion when you can't deal with it. Does Twisted Swain run Swain Boat and Cannon Shark? Depends on how greedy the build is. The answer, the answer is sometimes. I feel like I want to drag... I feel like I want to drag my curve down a little bit. I think I want Solari Soldier as another one drop to have a little bit of extra presence in the early game and just be another cheap Nightfall enabler. Bastion's been a little whatever. Let's try that change. Pulls the curve down a touch too. What's the ranking system or is there one? You earn uh, ladder points when you win. You lose ladder points when you lose. Win more than you lose. You climb up a similar system to Magic Arena. Karma Ezreal, so they're a go big control deck. So usually I'm going to want to be aggressive here to run them down before they get to the late game with their champions leveled. I'm going to mulligan these, so I'm going to keep stalking shadows and one Diana here, I think. Hey, and there's a one drop. Lovely. Raise your weapon, Sunwood. Punish transgressions. I think we just bank the two mana here, the two spell mana, and the next turn we can Stalking Shadows plus Diana. So with that, because they don't have anything for Diana to challenge here, I think I just Doom Beast. Get to go ahead and get this down, get wor her working towards leveling up here. Opponent just banking mana in their first couple of turns here. Their deck tends to play a lot of uh, pieces of spot removal, so wouldn't be surprised to see some of that happen here. Just, uh, just a shadow assassin. Could still see like a mystic shot or a get excited happen. My opponent letting me get to attackers with this feels good though. Gotcha, sure. Until the little icon there pop up on my deck when I attack. That's because Nocturne levels when Nightfall allies attack, so he got a point towards this level up with that attack. I think I'm Spacey Sketcher, Binning. Moon Dream's actually probably worth keeping here because the while the range on its invoke is pretty big, as we get into the late game. It, uh, as we get into the late game, having a huge range on Invoke isn't necessarily a bad thing. 
Is this your species get your feel clunky in this deck? It's fine. I think you often use it to discard um the thing the thing you have to realize about Spacey Sketcher is that Spacey Sketcher is not really a Nightfall enabler most of the time. It's not a card you want to play out on turn one. It's something that you like fill out your curve with in the mid game when you have something that you know you aren't going to need or want. So I think if you're if you're looking at that card and going, okay, I'm playing this as an enabler for Nightfall, you're going to be sad because it doesn't do that. That's not its intention in the list. I already have a bunch of champions in my hand, so Written in the Stars didn't seem very good. I think I'm just going to take Traveler here as something rolled up for later. This uh, Cosmic Inspiration is going to be real, real good. It might be wrong to play Diana out here because then I can't Cosmic Inspiration next turn. Playing her did trigger Nightfall, though, so that's fine. We'll probably go Traveler here on their turn. And then we'll untap and get to Cosmic Inspiration. Can they beat me if I double Cosmic Inspiration? All their removal is damage based, right? May all those who journey find what they seek. I go waste the form in mushrooms. So this card is super powerful because in addition to having it, you have to behold another celestial card. And thankfully we have plenty of celestial cards in this deck. Yeah, they sometimes they sometimes play deny, which uh, lets them counter a spell, fast or slow spell. This is probably them digging for deny. I need to kill my stuff in response here. That seems pretty okay for me. Hey, Springsbug, I'm glad you're enjoying it. Thank you for the entire year's support. It's awesome to see a lot of my long-term folks enjoying it as well. Deal. They're just spending their removal here because the removal is not going to be useful here. All my stuff gets big. We're going to play Diana out here as a 5-5 five because five, she's going to level up. I feel like from an emotional perspective, the current mix of Magic content has worked for me. There's definitely a lot of kind of poopy games in Magic still, but like only doing one to two decks a day makes it easier to like get through those because that way when they happen, there's not as much of it guaranteed. Which is nice. I'll be interested to see if only doing one to two decks a day keeps my people who are only here for magic content engaged. It may, it may not. They cannot hide. Uh, the magic deck we played today exceeded expectations.
So they're digging, digging for that deny here again. Usually just a one or two of. Yeah, that's the other reason to keep doing magic stuff is like, if I do a little bit of magic to start every, every day, we hopefully grab one or two more of my regulars and get them to check out Runeterra. Move them, move them over. We each hold a world within. Yeah, yeah, it only it only takes like two hundred dollars worth of wild cards. Night flowers upon my blade. The promise of a new moon upon you, Bloom Tender. Yeah, I mean, everything, like, we played two of those Behold cards, right? All of our things are plus four, plus four, plus four. They are large and in charge. And conviction. Their Ezreal's getting close to leveling here, though. Breathe in, breathe out. I unfortunately don't have three Nightfall allies, so I can't level Nocturne this turn. I think I want to play Nocturne pre-combat, though, because I want to give Ezreal vulnerable so I can force him to block. Even if they have, like, the 10 mana will here to bounce our board, most of these just cost 1 and 2 mana, right? So I'm just going to redeploy and kill them. This is fearsome, so it can only be blocked by things with 3 plus attack. Yeah, it's one of it's one of the better payoffs for having lots of things that invoke, right? Like you can splash invoke into almost anything, but the really powerful invoke cards require you to reveal a celestial as well. Uh, actually, so this is small, but it's the same, it's the same amount of damage. So I want to put Ezreal in front of the 6-6 six, six here because, um, I don't want them to be able to deal, deal two and then three to kill this. I want them to have to deal six. Nah, they're pretty close to dead as is. I think I just do this in attack. I don't think I, I need this necessarily. Like they're still still dead here, right? They could have some stuns. We could see like concussive palms or tempest steals here. What about the free to play aspect of Rune Terra? Rune Terra has both the most generous free to play and pay to play system of any card game out there. It is not, and it's not particularly close. All right, Ezreal's gonna level up here, but he's dead at least. The there's no random card packs in Runeterra to get your cards. You get to buy wild cards directly if you spend money. The most expensive card type costs three dollars at most. If you spend more money in larger increments, they're as cheap as two seventy. The average, the average cost of a competitive deck costs about 25 bucks to build outright. 
Rune, Rune Terra has decided to largely monetize itself via cosmetics. So now we have to hope they don't have another Ezreal. If they have another Ezreal, we're probably going to get combo killed here. Needed, needed to end the game one turn sooner. So, opponent's deck here looks to get both their champions into play leveled. Karma is one of them. Karma says whenever you cast a spell, cast it again. And then Ezreal here says whenever you um, whenever you cast a spell, he deals two damage to something. So these two together team up to deal lots and lots of damages. I think we're probably dead here, right? This is this says elusive, so it's gonna get to hit us to make a mystic shot. Yeah, I needed to kill them before they got to this point. Something, something to think about. Someone talked about us being a little bit more aggressive last turn. If I would have Pale Cascaded and drawn a card here. If I would have Pale Cascaded and drawn a card last turn, I would have gotten Doom Beast. And Doom Beast would have let me... Um, Doom Beast would have let me level Nocturne, which would have meant I would have attacked for lethal past their blockers. So maybe I should have pushed more aggressively to level Nocturne that turn. To not give them the out of Karma into second Ezreal. So could have played around them being able to kill us there with a different line. Yeah, we were one one turn short with the sequence I took, and if I would have sequenced differently, we could have could have killed them that turn. Okay, so Draven Jinx is an aggressive deck. Basically, all my cards here are kind of bad in the aggro matchup, so I'm gonna go ahead and full mulligan. Feels good to have a cheap play here. Like the addition of Solari Soldier here a lot. Devotion to battle. Are they a Poro Cannon deck? Well, I'm glad. I'm glad we've got Lenari Shade Stalker. So these are elusive, which is similar to flying. Can only be blocked by other elusive units. Okay, just pass the turn. Pass here. Assume they're gonna hit me for two. Very aggressive start here for the opponent. So they had a Vision, which gives their things plus one attack permanently. So he's now two power elusives. I do have an elusive of my own here in Shade Stalker, but I need Nightfall for it to be elusive. So I'm going to go ahead and play Spacey Sketcher out. Silence a follower. That's perfect. So silencing a card... Wipes all of the text off of it, except its base stats. So when I silence one of these dorks, it's going to lose Elusive, and it's going to lose its power-up, which is great. I'm going to go ahead and attack with everything here, because if they want to block anything with Draven, my Pale Cascade will trade for Draven. Wait, do Epic cards really have dupe protection too? That's insane. Be very quiet for hunting Poros. What is dupe protection? You so there aren't random card packs in the game, but you do still get random cards for free in your free to play rewards. So uh, dupe protection means when you get epic or champion cards at random you won't get max you won't get copies of things you already have okay pale cascade to save this even though it doesn't draw a card here having my elusive to block their daring poro seems good dupe dupe protection is basically the thing that yeah It's, it's good. Watch and learn. Fear not death. Hold still. Don't 
Do I pale cascade here? No, right? Because it's a two-one already. I'm dumb. Let's not be dumb. So I'm gonna go to thirteen. All those are gonna trade off. Time for the money makers. Do I pale cascade here to keep this alive? I think so. I get to draw a card. Like my two-two in and of itself isn't super valuable, but. Having, having a body in general is good, and I kind of want to use my mana and draw a card here. Draven, when he comes into play or strikes, he creates a spinning axe, which is a combat trick here. So uh, give one attack, but they have to discard a card to use it, so there's a little bit of cost associated with it. Meteor shower sound. Chef's kiss here. Cancellations are stories in the sky. But Sigil of the Messenger would be good in this deck to provide more Celestial Spiel. I can see that card being okay. It's also a pretty good Nightfall Enabler. Who is knock knock knocking at my chamber? What's up, Joe? No Need help? Wiser. Flat world. Okay, you know you know the rules. Bring bring the switch in here and I'll help you out. Probably gonna start by attacking here, I imagine. If they don't open on attacks, this card slaughters them, so. And if they do open on attacks, we're probably in an okay spot still. The answer is yes, somewhere. Okay. So, they decided it was worth the risk to play this out, but again here, because they didn't start the turn by attacking, I get a chance to play a card now, and my Meteor Shower is going to make them very, very sad. Let's switch. Hey, what do you need? It is a touch room. What do you, what do you, what do you have in trouble with? Oh, flat one. Sorry, Chat, where is the where is the setting to create a flat world? World type infinite flat. Figured it out. Figured it out. World type. Got it. You want to be in creative mode? It's in it's in this one. It's world type. So it starts with F F L E T flat. See, reading would make this whole playing games easier. Yeah, Twisted Diana is very much a mid-range deck. Very, very, very much mid-range deck. We were peaceful once. All right, so we're going to make this little dork vulnerable so we can force it to block here. The world comes flat by default just like in real life. Yep, something like that. I have pretty decent attacks here, and we have this heal five in hand in star shaping, so feeling relatively safe here. So this is vulnerable, which means we can force force anything to force it to block anything. They're gonna have to put some chumps up in front of some of these other things here. As a magic player, I take offense to reading makes the game easier. <laughs> it's funny because it's true. They can't block Nocturne here, because none of their stuff has 3 plus power, and he's very scary, chat. Very scary. Uh-oh. Well, poop. Now, that'll show me, chat. I was looking at his artwork, and we got visioned. That's fine, though, I think. We're still in an okay spot. This, in addition to healing 5, this also invokes a 7 plus cost Celestial. And pretty much all of the 7 plus cost Celestials are decent finishers. Do I play Hush as a gain 2? Maybe. Maybe. 
I'm not going to behold a celestial card, so we'll just get the immortal fire here. Do I like the new expansion? I do actually. Diana is my favorite champion out of this expansion. Not close. Oh, love her design. I think I'm gonna go ahead and hush this and wipe a wipe a power off of it. Oh, I guess it's only one power. I don't know why I had in my head that this was a one-one. I'm dumb. Probably wasn't worth it. Still hush. Especially with this elusive in play. So this costs eight, and I'm only gonna have nine total non-spell mana next turn. So I think I end step Diana here, and then we'll play the eight drop and we'll attack and see if we can kill them. Nightfall feels junky sometimes. Nightfall is excellent. I think the thing you need to wrap your head around to get good games and good experience with the Nightfall cards is that um, the Nightfall cards are not really... They're not they're not aggro cards. The Nightfall the nightfall package is largely very mid-rangey. Oh, yeah, I could use Dust Petal, couldn't I? That's a good catch. Yeah, I forgot about that. This lets me convert a spell mana, basically. So they're not dead on board, right? So I think I'm gonna go ahead and play my spacey sketcher, he says before his opponent concedes. Not dead on board, but dead enough. Moon casts her light across the land. Dead enough to pack it in. Yeah, yeah, the, the invoke mechanic is really just super flexible because it lets you it lets you access this kind of toolboxy thing that lets you solve problems depending on what that problem is. Diana knock is a combo deck. Yeah, kind of. I don't know. I think I think like I view like this deck for example that we're playing is definitely a I view it as a mid-range deck that Nocturne's a finisher. And if you want to call it a combo finish, I, I, I guess that could be an okay comparison. I think I'm mulliganing everything here about Diane. Ash, Diana, Ash to Johnny is uh, usually more mid-rangey. I don't think I want these Shade Stalkers to start. I want to be a little bit more interactive. Looking for an enabler for her, which we found perfect. Yeah, and worked out really well. I get to open on Solari Soldier here and attack for three. Follow the horizon. Follow the horizon. <laughs> the goodest boy over here. Like what, Drathmar? As always, I'd encourage you to be constructive and specific. Kind of vaguey posts like that are ones I, I... I If you weren't a sub, I'd time you out. Because you pay my bills, though, I'm going to give you a chance to explain yourself. So, what would you change? Why would you change that? Help, help me understand why you think I've made poor choices instead of just coming in here and being like, Jeff, your choices are bad and you should feel bad. Now they're playing Ash, so like Brittle Steel is a card we kind of have to be, kind of have to worry about. How's the five drop been? Serviceable. It's an okay mid rangey threat that draws you a card. Devotion to battle. My light for Avarosa. Fight the single fires. We're actually gonna play some Lux Ash Control after this set. We'll get to see Brittle Steel do some work. I think, in general, people tend to undervalue the flexibility of cards like this 5-drop and will often write them off without really understanding why they're good. Flex of flexibility is key on this, something like this. I'm just taking three here, huh? Quick 
we just lead on this? Come, a new phase awaits. I'm gonna take Crescent Strike here. My hand's got a, a good amount of value choked up in it, and Crescent Strike stunning two things for a turn can like be the thing we need to hopefully not get run over. I have no idea what that's referring to, Odo. This is super scary. And this is something too, right? Like, this is, um, the opponent's archetype was considered the best deck before this most recent set release, but people just stopped playing it for a little while because they just wanted to explore other things, right? And now, like, the new novelty of the formats worn off, people are going back to just playing good decks that were good before and are still good now. I'm through waiting. I think Bastion's a card I could probably give up. I think there's some value in, like, playing cheeky one of Bastion's to, like, catch people off guard sometimes. I can see giving that one up. I like Hush in general. I think Hush has a good amount of flexibility. It's an effect that I'm, I'm into. Definitely feeling like we're just getting outclassed here on board. My opponent's units are much larger than mine. So many stars. And I don't I don't really have interaction to line up well into what they have going on to not die. Like I have I have a bunch of cards in my hand, but like their their units are just so large, their average card quality is going to overwhelm us here. Okay, Spacey Sketcher is something that could help us convert some of these into higher quality cards. Okay. Let's get maybe maybe keep our tires spinning here for a little bit. Not great, because they get to draw a card when this 2-1 dies, but wipes a 5-power thing out of play at least. Uh, Hush, Hush is until end of turn. I'm not familiar with that one, Otto. Oh, the celestial one. The celestial one is just for just for followers. The equinox is permanent, but it's only for followers. It does not impact things like Sajani. I guess we could just like do this again. It's like not exciting, but it like keeps our head above water. For the problem is like we're not really working towards anything, right? The trap is set. Maybe maybe we can high roll with this and find something useful here. All right, there's an obliterate target thing. The problem is they have so many things at this point, right? Uh, no dirty digits. Yeah, we, we just don't have a comeback. We get it from here. Our deck's not. Doesn't have sweepers in it. I feel like 
I feel like if the opponent's archetype is something that was going to pop back up again, that, um, honestly, maybe, maybe it's okay to just do this, do this anyways. Is it crazy to put some Ruination in our deck? Like, we have so much card advantage. I kind of don't hate the idea of, like, having, like, a Ruination or two to draw to. Maybe that's silly, though. I feel like if if you wanted to hedge if you wanted to hedge that matchup ruination is is a card that you would want to consider So Johnny Gangplanks so is another aggressively leaning matchup. Um, coming to Mulligan, Pale Cascade. I think Doom Beast is fine if they're going to be beating down on us. Their Scry Scryfall equivalent for Rune Terror. Yeah, Mova, Mova Linux. That's all, the, all you needed more. The site like that my deck lists are linked on. This card's very good, their archetype. It's uh, elusive and fearsome, so a very small number of things can block it. And both of their champions level when they've dealt damage to my Nexus five different rounds. Light flowers upon my which allows them to work up to that very quickly. Basically get, almost guarantees them a trigger on every one of their turns. Sister sounds good to work up to. She's pretty good in these mid-rangey matchups. I think I want to attack any of these into their 3-3, three -three, so I'm going to go ahead and pass here. Gonna spacey into Doom Beast here. Are we going wide enough that we can charge her against their that we can charge her against their make it rain deck? Equinox doesn't seem I guess Equinox lets me silence this idiot. This is like already at three out of five is the issue. So we're one turn off Golden Sister Stalking Shadows and see what we get. Yeah, I think we're I think we're in for another Doom Beast at this point, right? Get aggressive with that. It's my favorite emote and pet in Runeterra. Uh, I think I like the good boy. Either the good boy or the dark dragonling. Probably my two favorite pets. Do you have a game, Link? You do. Take it up with my friends. So Gangplank's gonna level and Gangplank's uh attack when he's leveled deals the damage to all my stuff. So like yeah. Get 
I don't understand this GP to Johnny Craze, but Misfortune has always been better. Um, it's just very easy to level Gangplank in their deck, and Gangplank's attack trigger is a big deal, as you're about to see. I think, I think the opponent's archetype, I don't know what the metrics look like, but from my experience playing on the ladder, I feel like their deck is the toughest matchup consistently for things that I play. I don't know what the win rate data looks like on Mobilitix, but... I would, I would be kind of surprised if their deck isn't one of the best decks in the format. Are we silencing the elusive? I don't think so, because they are going to level up regardless anyways, because they're going to have this Overwhelm. Yeah, Greg, describing uh, Gangplank as inevitable is super accurate. I think I'm just playing Golden Sister this turn. You definitely can, Lord Odin. I think it's number three right now, percentage-wise. I can't believe that. Animation is very in your in your face. And now that this is leveled, Sajani is also leveled because they have the same level up condition. Sajani is definitely the little bit scarier of the two, I think, because uh, Sajani threatens to like frostbite all of her stuff. No, if I spent my stream talking about arena bugs, I'd never have a chance to actually play. I was forged by yes, usually the opponent's archetype plays, uh... Usually their archetype plays... Um, what's it called? Uh, plays Riptide Rex. I unfortunately cannot trigger Nightfall twice here, so I can't quite kill Sajani, which sucks. I can hook Gangplank here, at least. It is time. I will be heard. Have a warning shot. All right, well, we dodged the make it rain on our face for the Sajani, so we got that going for us, at least. If that make it rain would have hit our face, this would have wiped the attack off of all of our units, which would have ended very badly for us. This game might still end badly for us, but we like have a small chance now at least. Yeah, that's it. That's it right there. The people are saying uh, arena people can't fix the wild card economy. You don't understand. It's not it's not a we don't want to, it's uh we don't need to. Not that they can't, they don't want to. All right, um, so we're not dead this turn at least. Glass half full. I do behold the Celestial card. So this warning shot, as well as Sajani's Overwhelm, means that I don't, I'm not going to, have, none of my things are going to have attack this turn. I can Doom Beast them to two at least. And then if we survive, another Doom Beast is potentially lethal.
Afternoon, Pelly. Okay, so this block is free because it's dying anyways. Uh, this bounces here. This... I think I just bounced that there. So the, the problem here, chat, is they still have this warning shot next turn, which means they get to fog my attacks again next turn. Is the is the issue. Okay. Pale cast, double kale, pale cascade could could pull it out for us, he says before he gets Riptide Rexed. Okay, so I need Spacey Sketcher. I need Spacey Sketcher to generate. I need Spacey Sketcher to generate another silence here, right? Oh, wait, Diana has Challenger. Okay, so if those last two cards are blanks, they're dead. I'm dead to another warning shot. But this. This hooks this, and then Pale Cascade here is lethal. I can't heal. I won't have enough mana. Survey says... All right, all right, that's a good one. That seems like a good one to end on. That, uh... Every, everybody clinch. Remember, chat, if you didn't end the game at one life, then you didn't use all of your resources as efficiently as possible. To wrap on this, this felt... Pretty competitive again. I like pulling the curve down with Solari Soldier. Uh, I agree with the comment earlier that Bastion feels kind of like a weak card. and I wouldn't mind replacing that. The one matchup that stood out to me as uh, this felt hard and wasn't really competitive for us was the Ash Sajani matchup. And I think if that was a matchup you wanted to hedge, playing one to two copies of Ruination could be okay. This is a card that'll get you value in other places as well. I think we have enough card advantage that we can, like, redevelop our board after we sweep. I think the easy cut would be Bastion for at least one. I don't know what I would do for the other one offhand. But I feel like if if I felt like the other kind of go biggie decks were something I needed to have a, have a hard time with, I think Ruination would be the catch-up card there. All right, at any rate, we're going to do a second rune tier deck today because we had a very generous donation from Dude Light. Uh, we are going to play some uh, Lux Ash Control, which is a, a deck that I've been uh, playing a bunch of off stream. I liked it last season. I think Screeching Dragon is a great addition to it. I'm going to hit a quick ad roll while I get everything tweeted out and flipped over. I need to run to the restroom as well. So I'll be back in just a couple of minutes with this. Thanks for hanging out today, folks. Don't go anywhere.